Where was I? Oh yeah, the remarks. This noted city was built on two mountains and contained two parts called the Upper and Lower City. The former was built on Mount Sion. That's with an S, not a Z. Mount Sion. The latter on Mount Acre. The city is supposed to have been founded by Melchizedek and then called Salem or uh, Solima. The warlike Jebusites possessed it when Israel entered Canaan. In the higher city, they long defended themselves against the Hebrews. Here they remained. <laughs> Till David subdued them and called their city the city of David. Herod the Great, when he repaired, or rather rebuilt the temple, added a vast strength and embellishments to this city, which accounts for its superb state and strength when it was destroyed. Most of the city was surrounded with three walls. On some places where it was deemed inaccessible, they had only one. The wall first built was adored and strengthened with 60 towers. 14 towers rested on the middle wall. Middle wall. Wow. The outside one, most remarkable for its workmanship, was secured with 90 towers. The tower uh, Fisfinus was most celebrated. It was 70 cubits high and eight angles and commanded a most beautiful prospect. Here the visitor might, in a clear atmosphere, delight himself with a view of the Mediterranean. 40 miles to the west, and most of the Jewish dominions. Some of these towers were nearly 90 cubits in height, and famous for their beauty, elegance, and curiosities. They were built of white marble and had the appearance of vast marble blocks. These huge piles gave to the city in the view of the adjacent country a most majestic appearance. Near the highest of these towers stood the royal palace of the most commanding elegance, incredible cost, had furnished its pillars and walks, presented the richest and most delightful scenery. This was the beauty and elegance of the north side of Jerusalem. On the east side stood the temple and the fort of Antonio, 
over against Mount Olivet. This fort built on a rock of 50 feet in height and of inaccessible steepness overlaid with slabs of marble. The castle of Antonio stood in the center of this fortress. This work, the workmanship of this castle made it more resemble a palace than a castle. A tower ordained each square of this fortress, one of which was 70 cubits high and commanded a full view of the temple. The temple was, in many respects, the most astonishing fabric ever beheld. Its site was partly of a solid rock, originally steep on every side. Uh. He's settling in for a good story, isn't he? This will even put the cat to sleep on bed. All right. Tough commentary. The lower temple had a foundation of vast dimensions, said to be 300 cubits from its lowest base, its foundation was composed of stone 60 feet in length. And the lower part of the superstructure was composed of stones of solid white marble. More than 60 feet long. and seven by nine feet in bigness. Bigness. Yeah, bigness. For four furlongs compassed the whole pile of building, which was 100 cubits high, with 160 pillars to afford both support and ornament. In the front were spacious and lofty galleries with cedar uh, wainscot uh, resting on uniform rows of white marble columns. Josephus asserts that nothing could exceed the exterior part of the house of God for exquisite workmanship and elegance. Its solid plates of gold seemed to strive to outdazzle the rising sun. The parts of the building not covered it with gold had at a distance, the appearance of pillars of snow or white marble mountains and the grandeur of the internal workmanship was this magnificent uh, uh, workmanship of this magnificent dome did not fail to bring fully equal to the this external magnificence, nothing superb, costly, or elegant was spared. The different part of the world had seemed to vie with each other to pour their most costly treasures into this wonderful treasury of heaven. 
70, never mind. No commentary. I'm just reading. This is my punishment, I think. <sighs> the lower story was decorated with sacred furniture. The table of shoe bread, altar of incense, and the candlestick of pure beaten gold. The altar and the table were overlaid with pure gold. Several doors of... I'm going to need that hand to turn the page, dude. Ah, damn pagan. The sanctuary were 55 cubits in height and 16 in breadth, overlaid also with gold. Fascinating. The richest Babylonian tapestry of purple, blue, and scarlet, and of exquisite workmanship, waved within these doors golden vines and leaves and clusters of grapes of gold were suspended from the ceiling five or six feet of curious workmanship. The temple had a huge eastern gate of pure Corinthian brass, a metal in the highest esteem probably in the steel or it would be a task to enumerate all the foldings of golden doors in the chambers carved works paintings and gildings, vessels of gold, scarlet, violet, and purple, uh, sacerdotal vestments, and all the incalculable piles of riches in this temple of Jehovah. The most precious stones, spices, and perfumes, everything that nature, art, or riches could furnish, were stored within these stupendous and hollowed walls. Right here were the city and the temple to be destroyed. For the infidelity, malice, hypocrisy, and persecution of the Lord of glory in himself and his followers, which characterize its rulers and people. Here, a measure of unprecedented atrociousness was just filled up, which should bring down wrath upon them to the uttermost. Ah. The tremendous ruin our Lord foretold and fulfilled. The last noted entrance into Jerusalem of him who was God manifest in the flesh took place on the Monday before the scene of his suffering. Amidst the acclamation of multitudes 
he was hailed king of Zion, which every token of joy, with every token of joy and praise. The air rang again with their praises uttered for all the mighty works they had seen. They sang, Hosanna, blessed be the highest, our Lord, superior to all their adulation, and knowing how soon the Hosannas of some of them would turn. Crucify him, end quote. Uh, and being touched with the sympathy and pity for a devoted city, now going to fill up their guilty measure of iniquity. Another quote. Behold the city and weep over it. He said, If those hadst known even thou in this thy day the things which belong to thy peace, but now they have hid from hid from shine eyes, not thine eyes, it says shine eyes. Uh, and it's a biblical quote. Don't recall that one. Shine eyes. Huh? Uh, for the day shall come when shine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children with thee. That's harsh. And they shall not leave thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. End quote. The day, but one after, Christ went into the temple for the last time. to instruct the people. While he was thus employed, the high priest, elders, Herodians, Sadducees, and Pharisees gathered to turn around him with a malicious view to entangle him with his talk. Christ returned such answers spake such parables and set home such reproof and conviction to their souls as not only to astonish and silence them, but to give them some awful prelibation of the final judgment which awaited them at his bar. Uh, he thus, in a free and pungent address to the disciples, administered the most dignified and keen reproofs for the cruelty, hypocrisy, and pride of the scribes and Pharisees. He foretold the malicious treatment that the disciples would meet with at their hands and then denounced the vengeance on that falling city, which for ages their crimes had been accumulating. He 
forewarned that this cup of divine indignation should be poured on that generation. His tender feelings of soul then melted in a most moving apostrophe. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stone them that they that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, for I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye say, a quote within a quote. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, in internal quote. Upon this our Savior left the temple. The disciples took an occasion to speak to Christ of the magnificence of the second edifice. How it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts. Master, said they, see what manner of stones the buildings are here? Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily, I say unto you, you, there shall not be left one stone upon another. That shall not be thrown down. End quote. How very unlikely must such an event have seemed. But it was indeed fulfilled upon that generation. I'm going to take a quick break. It's all right. I'm not going to smoke any of that nasty stuff while you're on my lap. Yeah, you don't like, it's like, oh, you're doing a disgusting thing. Where's the farthest place I can get from you? Which is fine. It'll stunt his, uh, his growth. Mm. Okay, where was I? That's really interesting. And antiseptic. I think it killed all those germs. You know, gingivitis stuff. It's all dead now. Nothing but healthy gums. Okay, where the fuck was I? Jesus, ow, hey, damn pagan, I was talking to Loki, not Jesus. See, Loki's real. I can prove it. There he is. That's Loki. Jesus and his disciples, dis you're biting me again. Jesus, ow! Jesus and his disciples retired to the 
Mount of Olives. Here the temple rose before them. Ow! I asked for that one. <laughs> In all its majestic eloquence. The surrounding scenery naturally suggested the conversation which followed. The disciples naturally suggested the conversation which followed. The disciples petitioned, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? End quote. Their minds seem to have been impressed with the preceding discourse, and they fell most readily upon the same subject and wished to know when such an event such awful events should come. And what warning should announce their approach? Our Lord replied, Take heed that no man deceive you. Too late. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Is though he had said, this shall be one signal token of the event as my denunciations relate to a primary accomplishment in the destruction of Jerusalem and to a more general and dreadful fulfillment of the destruction of Antichrist. In the last days, impostors, impostors shall abound. Even in 1925 and after? Imagine that. Impostors shall abound. False, false religion. False religionists. Terrible. False religionists shall deceive and ruin many. Let us trace the fulfillment of this and several succeeding predictions. This was fulfilled in relation to Jerusalem. Not long after Christ's ascension, the Samaritan uh, Dostinios appeared and declared himself the Messiah, predicted by Moses, that one. Simon Magnus also declared himself the great power of God. Soon, soon after, another importer appeared from the mongrel Samaritans. The church has never been annoyed by such kind of Samaritans who have ever been faithful in vile importers crying low here and low there. This imposter promised to exhibit to the people 
sacred utensils said to be deposited by Moses in Mount Gerizim. Here, a new decision must be given from heaven to the generation between the Jews and Samaritans as to the place of worship, a thing of which schismatics have ever been exceedingly fond, to derive some new light upon their party question directly from above as though decisions already given were insufficient. Armed multitudes sallied forth to follow this Messiah, confident their great deliverer had at last made his appearance, but Pilate, the Roman governor, checked their fanaticism with the sword and put their fancied Messiah to death. Another imposter, Thaddeus, arose. He had the address to persuade multitudes to follow him into the wilderness under the promise that he would cause the River Jordan to divide. The Roman procurator, Thaddeus, with a troop of horse, pursued them, slew the importer and many others, and dispersed the faction. <coughs> Pardon me. Deceivers under the government of Felix were multiplied, leading off people into the wilderness under the promise and fanatical expectation that they, wait, expectation, wait, that they should there see signs and wonders. The old serpent often leads fanatical people into the wilderness of error and delusion, under similar expectations. The vigilant eye of the Roman governor rested on those impostors and was sure to frustrate their designs as oft as they appeared. In the year 55 arose a notable Egyptian importer named Felix. 30,000 followed him under the persuasion that from Mount Olivet they should see the walls of Jerusalem fall to the ground at his command. For their easy capture of the Roman garrison there, and their taking possession of Jerusalem. There, wait, they were attacked by the Roman governor. Four hundred were slain, the rest dispersed. The Egyptian impostor escaped for his life. In the year 60, another pretended messiah, appeared engaging to break the Roman yoke if they would follow him into the wilderness 
for the deceiver and his followers soon fell a sacrifice to the vengeance of Festus, the governor. It would be unwieldy to mention all the vile impostors of this period. They were a vast retribution of righteous heaven upon the Jews. For, having rejected and put to death the true Messiah, and all those other ones, but especially that one, Sorry, no more commentary. And they fulfilled the warning given by our Lord of a host of deceivers of that period. How prone were men to court deception. Christ had said to the Jews... I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not? If another should come in his own name, him will ye receive. This was fulfilled, and not only then, but in every age of this day. Those who give the best evangelical evidence of their being claims of egotus are by them fully allowed as in water Face answers to face, so the heart of man to man. End quote. Someone actually said that, I guess. Our Lord proceeds, And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things shall come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in divers places. And famine and pestilence and all these are the beginning of sorrows. Sorry about that. And I had you all sucked into that story, you huh? know? I turn around. Sorry. <sighs> Take a break right here. Pet the kitty for a while. Load another bowl. And continue on page six.